there. All right. Where Jennifer? She's pregnant. Jennifer is on her way into performance issues. This is what we do. I want you to look at this. Here we got a 2006 Ram 1500 four wheel drive V8 57 bin 2 mileage 94,000. And the vehicle had a DTC fault. PO335 for crank position sensor 642 for sensor reference voltage one circuit low and P2122 for accelerator pedal position sensor circuit and it also lacked power. So here we've got a truck and we got to figure out what's going on with this thing. And so what we got the technician found a wiring diagram included with the 642 diagnostic trouble code diagnostic chart. All three codes could be set by the sensors residing on the same circuit. See they're all on the same circuit right here going to that. So that's kind of where they're sort of tied together on that side of that. So he tested the circuit to verify a 5 volt reference. Now 5 volt reference is what it sends out to the sensors. It slowly shorts that away based on a thermistor or a position, you know, potentiometer or whatever, you know, or pressure if it's a transducer. The pink yellow wire was only showing 1.6 volts that the PCM technician thought one of the sensors could be shorted. So he disconnected all the sensors. You get that? He disconnects all the sensors. See if the voltage comes up. And the wire was still reading 1.6 volts. Should be 5 volts, but it still measured 1.6. So these are some, you know, these three wire sensors that he's got that are supposed to be feeding on that. So he dis disconnected the pink yellow wire from the PCM. Now there was 5 volts coming out of the PCM. What was the wiring diagram leaving out? Okay. All right, so using the wiring diagrams, he locates the engine oil pressure sensor that was also powered up on the same circuit. Once that sensor was disconnected, he got 5 volts. So the engine oil pressure sensor was replaced, the technician cleared the codes and road tested until all the monitors were complete and the problem was corrected. Now who's replaced an oil pressure sensor in here? You and you on a Chrysler product had an oil pressure sensor on that one over there. And that thing was a monster, wasn't it? This one here wasn't so terribly bad if it was in there behind the alternator and all that. So this is what it looks like, engine oil pressure sensor. See this? You basically got your oil pressure signal, which is coming from here, and you, this is basically your signal return. <coughs> Remember, signal return is a ground. Signal is the one that changes with the input, and reference voltage is going to come from here. That's not something you can burn a test light with, but you can read it with a meter or a scope. And that's where that one was. The sensor, oil pressure sensor on that one behind the alternator on the V8s. We've actually changed them before on some of the uh, uh, Dodge Chargers and stuff, because they like to throw codes and screw up and all that. So sooner or later, if you work on cars very much, if you work on Dodges, you're going to have to replace an oil pressure sensor, right? All right, <coughs> this one right here, 2002 GMC Envoy, four-wheel drive, L6, 4.2 liter, then S mileage, 136, still 04. The vehicle stalled only when activating the left turn signal. The left turn signal, engine stalls, right? The customer also noticed the left headlight was dim. The customer replaced the headlight, but there was no change. Stalling problems started to get progressively worse until it happened all the time. What are you thinking? You got a dim headlight. It stalls only when you turn on the left turn signal. You get any ideas about that? Technician found only two volts using the ground circuit of the headlight and left turn signal for reference. So the both components are grounded at the same location right here. Right? which is located on the engine block. So the ground looked good and tight, the bolt was corroded and rusty. The wire diagram showed the fuel pump relay coil also grounded at the same place. So it's basically being around the ground through the light bulb. When you turn on the turn signal, the light bulb comes on, the ground goes away because the turn signal is eliminated. Fuel pump quits running and then you, you, you die. You know, it kills it. All right, and so the, if that right there is where you found the problem. So, and it was on there. And that was on a vehicle like that one we got out there. That uh, that envoy we got out there. All right. Wire brushed the contact point on the engine block. Replaced the bolt and washer. Headlight was bright. The stalling problem with the left turn signal was gone. Uh, a lot of times, if you just look at one and it looked good and tight and clean, that don't mean it is. You may have to take it off and wire brush it and put it all back on there. It needs to be nice and shiny where there's nothing to, to drop voltage. Uh, here's the 01 Pontiac Grand Prix, 3.6 liter V8, then K automatic transmission, mileage 138, 446. This vehicle came to the shop with a P, uh, PO404, which sat right away after clearing. The customer noticed the engine stumbled on mild acceleration. Now this is the one of the, this is what people are doing to, to fix vehicles in the real world. 
Now the EGR valve could be commanded open with a scan tool. You've done that. You've got to have a two-way talking scan tool. You can't do it with a cheap scan tool. It's got to be a good one. The engine only stumbled at idle when commanded to 60%. Remove the EGR valve and inspected all the ports and they were clear. To make sure it didn't have any you know, gummy stuff in them that stops them up. Sometimes whenever the EGR valve has got just some ports stopped up, the one that's getting all the EGR will skip and stuff. Right? Or you'll have surges for that reason. Uh, so the EGR position voltage was only 1.75 volts when the valve was commanded to the wide open position. should have been higher than that. The voltage in the sensor matched the scan tool data. So why did he do that? He's checking a sensor to make sure it agrees with a scan tool so he knows the scan tool is not getting, a, you know, putting together some bad numbers. And in the real world, the technician replaced the EGR valve. Now the position voltage reached four and a quarter volts at the wide open position. The diagnostic trouble code was cleared. And the problem was resolved. Who's going to know you're going to replace the EGR valve to make a little stumble go away, right? Here's another one. Buick with Sabre Limited 3.8. Sounds almost like that car we got out there, doesn't it? Starting this one reminds us of you know, the days of distributor caps and rotors. Poof, it would kick back. Whenever a distributor cap had carbon tracks in it or water in it, it would kick back when you're trying to start it over, fire on a cylinder that's coming up and stop the crankshaft and all that. Also backfiring in the intake when it does start, there's a really strong sound of intake air initially. Backfiring through the intake is called what? You ever heard it go boop, boop through the intake? Glenn, Glenn was working on that truck out there and he noticed it backfiring through the intake sometimes. That's induction backfire is what's called by that. A lot of times that's the, if it's not caused by spark plugs firing out of time, it can be caused by one by a lean one. Uh, the 4.3 liter likes to do that. If the plugs are wet on a 4.3, one of them Chevrolets like the with a V6, if it's got throttle body, you can have dirty spark plugs and everything else be right, and it'll blow fire out the throttle body that far. Now, once it runs long enough, it goes into closed loop, everything straightens out, it reacts normal, acceleration and performance are good. Uh, many parts have been replaced. Mass airflow, throttle position, crank position, cam position, intake air temperature, PCM, wire harness, the ignition module, the crank and vacuum is three inches. Why is that important? So you don't do the same things again? No, the crank and vacuum being three inches is what I was talking about. Now I'm saying, uh, I should have answered my bit better. Crank and vacuum is something that's going to tell you how well the engine's breathing, at least when it's spinning over, right? So if it's not breathing good, you may have some, you know, timing issue or something like that. All right. So after a lot of brain torture, you discovered the electronic spark coming. You seen one of these recently? You did one yesterday. The original problem was the car was traded in with that condition. Prior shop had replaced everything but the kitchen sink. In the end, it proved to be the new ignition module that was installed was bad, but never gave any codes. And the scanner showed electronic spark timing bypass functioning, but wasn't switching, so on and so forth. The ignition module was the problem was on that one. I have taken a timing light hooked it up to one of the plug wires, pulled it inside the car if you had leads long enough, and had it in there in a the shade, and I would hold a uh, trigger let it flash the whole time, and sometimes whenever the engine would cut out, you could see that flat flashing wrong, and that tells you you got a ignition issues on that one, but this one here was something else. Here's the 98 Expedition 5.4, 135,000 miles, idle's too high, all right, idle at 1,500 cold and 1,900 hot. Mm. IAC counts are at 75 to 80 when at idle. Well, that's you know, typically if it's idling too fast and the IAC is trying to control it and it can't, it'll have IAC counts that are at zero uh, in spite of the fact that it's idle. That'd be a air leak, typically. Inspects for vacuum leak, then find any checks stuck open, PCV, you know, PCV valve can be, if you got a PCV valve that's come apart some back in the day when some of them were plastic, they'd come apart and you'd have too much air going in there. So you use a special function of the IAC counts drop to 40 as a start point, the vehicle idles at about 750, which is a spec. He commands 80 counts, he's idling at 1900 just like a vehicle in the IAC. So he checks the throttle, it's not stuck open and the TPS is one volt. That's normal on a GM. I mean on a, on a Ford GM, it's kind of like, used to like to be half a volt. Uh, and looking at a loss as to why the PCM is commanding such a large IAC opening. So even though the TPS voltage was within the range indicated for idle, he noticed the computer was recognizing it as part throttle. Now I've seen this being caused by the little crimps there in the throttle. Looked clean and all that, but you could solder those suckers where it didn't see part throttle, and it would basically fix that. Uh, replace the TPS, the voltage is still at the same one volt. Engine idle down, the scanner displays idle. 
feed a little, little bit of the voltage deflection will make that thing, when you first start it, it's seeing closed throttle, and then whenever you fire it up, it tags that as closed throttle. If it sees the voltage even a little bit above that, it thinks you're still at uh, off idle, and it's doing this dash pop function wherever it's holding it up, waiting for you to let off so it can come down slowly. It's, uh, if it's showing part throttle on the scan tool, you need to go after that. Like I say, I would take those uh, terminals out of there and I would solder the crimps to make sure we still didn't have any trouble. 2001 Chrysler Sebring LX size 3 liter mileage 98,000 cuts out. What does cuts out mean? That's the opposite of cuts in, right? Pay attention, Kayla. I performed lab scope testing and I confirmed the synchronization of the cam sensor and the crank sensor don't agree with Mitsubishi published waveforms. That's a good thing you need to know. Now this morning you removed the timing covers, confirmed all the timing marks on the new timing belt were correct. Removed the reluctor crankshaft pulley assembly and the reluctor plate had not moved on the two very small dowel pins which keep it aligned and in time. So run into problem somebody trying to mix up 3 liter Mitsubishi parts with this 3 liter Mitsubishi Chrysler conglomerate. Feel that if it was to replace the timing belt, the crankshaft pulley reluctor and this piece of trash Chinese distributor, he's betting the car would be fixed. Unfortunately, those parts would cost around $1,800 from the dealer, and so that has the tendency to put people in a little bite. So an OEM distributor fixed that car. You got that? So the difference between the optical plate between all the aftermarket supply distributor assemblies and this one ordered from the Dodge dealer based on the VIN number are incredible. There's just all kinds of different ones that look just right but they got, they're slightly different. So you gotta make sure you're using the right one. 98 Chevrolet S10 LS 4.3. There's gonna be a test on all these, by the way. You'll have to remember everything I've said up here. Mileage 165,000 miles, surge cuts out. And tested fuel pressure. Every sensor, EGR, crank, end plate. This truck runs like a top with no code. The only time it acts up is in first gear. When you try to punch it from a low speed, it acts like a rev limiter. Doesn't do it in any other gear. All right, the problem was the air intake tube had a crack in it. And between the throttle body and the mass airflow tube. So when you're taking off, what's different? What's different from first gear to the other gears? More engine torque, right? More engine torque means what? It's pulling that, that crack open. It pulls the crack open, it's not reporting all the air that's coming in, and it loses. And then where the torque goes away, it closes it back up. So mm, mm, I've seen that before. I saw a Ford Probe one time. They had one of those, uh, the wire harness was almost too tight, stretched up here to the mass airflow when it was unplugging that, doing that, on a Ford Probe that we had. All right, OED2, here you go. Question one, eep, eep, eep. I'm going through this quick so that y'all don't turn into a skeleton. I know an OED2 onboard diagnostic tube system with all enabling criteria for a given diagnostic is met. It's considered which of these terms? Is that freeze frame, turned up engine, warm-up cycle or a trip. And this is a little criteria that it's got to do to clear all of its monitors. To get rid of the P1000 that you get when you've cleared the codes. What do you call that? You got 10 seconds to make up your mind. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Write it down. Technician A says a compression test can be used to test the condition of connecting rods. Technician B says a cylinder leakage test fills the cylinder with compressed air and the gauge indicates the percentage of leakage. Who is right? A, B, C, or D? A, B, both or neither. How do PCMs generally determine which injector to operate on a sequentially injected engine? A, by updating the adaptive numerator. B, with the signal from a cylinder ID sensor or a cam sensor. C, it doesn't matter which injector fired first. Or D, by remembering which injector it fired last when the engine was shut down. You have to know how these people think. Technician A says all returnless fuel systems are electronic. Technician B says all returnless fuel systems have a regulator built into the fuel filter. Who's correct? I will put pictures there. Okay. 
Right. Which sensor does the uh, input that the BCM consider most important for fuel control on a speed density system? Mass airflow, MAP, TCT, or DPFE? Air bubbles cause more problems for engines with a turnless fuel system because the turnless fuel system require a lower, really lower pressure. The turnless injectors deliver less fuel. The air generally stays in the fuel rails until it finally works its way through an injector or none of the above. Air Everybody in there should make a hundred on this test. Magnesium A says on every turnless fuel system with a tilted fuel rail, a cylinder fed by the lowest part of the fuel rail will skip if the air gets trapped in the rail. Technician B says the highest cylinder on the fuel rail will probably be the malfunctioning cylinder. A, B, both or neither. What mechanical measurement can be done with the valve cover removed to determine if the camshaft lobe is worn on a pushrod engine? Cylinder contribution test, head bolt torque test, dial indicator test on the push rods, you can't tell without removing the cam cap. Yeah, Caleb then went to sleep. Alright, when air bubbles are present in the fuel rail on a warm engine, there's no visible leak. What's the probable cause of the air? Let's say you got air bubbles in the fuel rail on a warm engine and there are no visible leaks. What's the probable cause of the air? What's the probable source of the air? Excuse me. Fuel pump leaking the return line, blockage in the filler tube, none of the above. The escort that Noah pulled the engine out of and put it back in was given trouble and wouldn't start, and Noah finally got it started. What did Noah do to get the escort started? Anybody besides Noah know that? What'd you do, Noah? Say it loud. Well, I put fresh gas in it and I fixed the fuel. Had, mask, had bad gas in it. Fired right up when he put good gas in it. And that's what's real simple to do. What's volumetric efficiency? Now, Tim, this is important. There is a volumetric efficiency calculator you can download on your smartphone and you can pull data from that little ELM 327 thing you got and plug it in and it'll tell you what the volumetric efficiency is. It tells you if it's able to breathe like it should. And basically what it's after. So measurement of fuel flow, air flow as opposed to intended air flow, a pointless equation, a measurement of the fuel in the filter. Did y'all put that new fuel filter on that truck? Yeah. You did? You already done that? Okay. Well that's smooth. Outstanding performance. All right, let's put through these right quick and then we'll be done. We're going to tell you why that is. Good. What did you put on this one? Somebody tell me. Hey. That's a trip. This is a trip. That is a trip. Compression test can be used to test the condition of a connected rod. Is that true? If you got one that's bent, it can. And you won't know for sure it's a connecting rod problem. But I had a little deal where this guy had a 40 pounds less compression on one cylinder than all the rest of them when he pulled the head off and they parted it through. That piston was coming up a quarter of an inch lower than all the rest of them because the connecting rod was bent because it had drank some water at some point and bent the rod. B says a cylinder leakage has filled the cylinder with compressed air and the gauge indicates the percentage of leakage. Well, I'm going to say both of those guys are right. Now, I, I will tell you it's going to be difficult if everything else has been exhausted and you know that you don't have the same amount of piston travel, you got a rod problem, but you're going to find that first with a compression test. Uh, PCM generally determined, typically you're going to do it with a cylinder ID sensor or a cam sensor. It's going to tell you which injectors work first. A says all returnless fuel systems are electronic. B says all returnless fuel systems have a regulator built into the fuel filter. Neither one of those guys are right because anytime you see all on a question, 
then you know that that's the jig is up. All, every, always, those are, those are red flag answers. Point sensor input, see, uh, neither one of those guys were right. Uh, which sensor input does the PCM consider most important for fuel control on a speed density system? What is a speed density system? A speed density system is where it's using speed and the density there in the intake to determine what to do with the fuel. That tells, that's how it tells load, right? So it does that with a MAP sensor, it doesn't do it with a mass airflow sensor. Because this friend of mine one time that was working on a, uh, one of those old Broncos, this old Bronco, this guy had took a, uh, a Mustang engine with multi-point fuel injection on it, and cammed it up, he popped it in this Bronco, and it was puffing black smoke and it was idling, but when you got above it, idling it wouldn't puff black smoke. Why is that? What does it do to the engine vacuum whenever you cam one up? Thomas would know that when you do this. What's it do to the engine vacuum when you put a cam in there? Race car man, what's it do? If you're measuring engine vacuum and one is idling and it's cammed up with more lift and duration, you're going to have low engine vacuum, right? When it's idling. Low engine vacuum to the map sensor means too much load. So it's going to make black smoke. Put too much fuel in there. It's too hot in here. That's one of the reasons people are getting sleepy. All right. When students start fooling with the thermostat, it screws everything up. That's why I put that sticker on there. Air bubbles can cause more problems for engine with return the fuel systems because the air stays in the fuel rail until it finally works its way through the injector. I worked on a V8 in a Lincoln Continental one time, and it was nice and level sitting in the engine compartment. It was a V8 with 4.6. And this thing right here, when I had my uh, uh, IDS hooked up to it, actually it was a worldwide diagnostic system back then, this thing had a walk-in skip that would walk through the fire in order. It would skip on one, then three, then seven, then two, six, five, four, eight, and it would go and do it over and over again. It was the fuel pump was cavitating, putting the air in there, and it was working it through the. Uh, it was the strangest thing I ever saw. It stumped the hotline. I called the hotline about it. They didn't have a clue what to do, but I figured out whenever I looked at the fuel pressure, it was bouncing around, and whenever I bled all the air out of the fuel rail, that problem would go away. It was a little bit of a rough idle kind of thing. Yeah, that car didn't have a fifteen thousand mile on it. Needed a fuel pump. I want to return a system with a tilted fuel rail. I worked on a Dodge one time. It was skipping on cylinder number one because there was air, there was air being put in there by the fuel pump that was gathering at the top of the fuel rail and there was an air bubble that was always on the number one injector. That's what this is talking about. The highest cylinder on the fuel rail will probably be the malfunctioning cylinder. That's going to be technician uh, B. He's going to be the right one there. Uh, what mechanical measurement can be done? You can do a dial indicator test on the push rods. Remember the story about the 4.8 we had? It was underpowered and it was, you know, didn't feel like it. You couldn't tell anything was going on, but you could hear a little noise under the valve cover. So we basically did a, uh, looked at the spec in the book for what the uh, lift was supposed to be, and the exhaust valve had about a quarter of an inch less lift than it was supposed to have. I say a quarter of an inch, no, it wasn't much, because it's only got about a quarter of an inch lift anyway. It seemed like it was like, 40 thousandths less than the other ones, and that was that told us we had a camshaft issue. All right, air bubbles present the fuel rail, warm engine, no visible leaks, fuel pump. Typically, we'll have a cavitating fuel pump right there. Um, and that's one of the last thing right there. Volumetric efficiency is an actual measure of airflow as opposed to intended airflow. When that air's got to go in here and make a lot of curves, and the engine's running at full speed, you're like, whatever, it's not going to get all the air it needs. In spite of the fact, uh, uh, Tim, if you look at that uh, volumetric efficiency thing on your, uh, uh, your little scan tool thing you got for your phone, it lies actually because there's no way you're, unless you've got a natural, I mean a, a supercharged or a turbocharged engine, you're not going to have 100% volumetric efficiency. But that thing will try to act like you do. You know, the algorithm's not right on it or something. Anyway, anybody you got any questions or comments or you just want me to shut up? Everybody about to, about to croak in here because it's too, too hot. It's hot. It is hot. It is too hot in here. Who, who keeps jacking around with the thermostat? That's what I was about. You know what I mean? Makes you want to take it yeah. down. Yeah. I didn't do it today. Yeah. Today wasn't me. Huh? I didn't do it. I have sweat on my forehead and I don't even have a headband anymore today. I'll have to make a headband out of a shop right on a paper clip, I guess. <laughs> all right, then. So, uh, all right. So, as long as we got, did y'all learn something from Adam whenever he was talking? Huh? Yeah. You did? Adam's got a wealth of knowledge up there. He can tell you stuff. Oh, I thought I was trying to turn that off. All right. All right, put that in your uh, thing out there and uh, whatever grade. Who made, who, made, who made a perfect grade? 
Yeah, why not?